Hello, welcome to my channel, another Bibliophile Reads. My name is Greg, and I am here to do a variation of the Would You Read It Challenge by Steve Donahue. Now, this challenge has its origins and sources and many other videos, which include Etu Brode, Rachel Maru, A Cruel Reader's Thesis, and, and some others. And um, in this video, what I intend to do is read from four selections of books that I read in um, 1991 when I was in my late 20s. Each of these books I really liked at the time that I read them. And I'm going through a challenge, a different challenge of rereading books for 2000, uh, for 2022. And I wanna reread some of these books that I, that I enjoyed in my youth. So I am going to read the selections. I'm not going to give the title or the author. I am just going to read the text until I get to a natural breaking point. And um, after that, in the comments, make, make a note that would you read any of these books? And um, the book that gets the most amount of comments saying um, people would read it, I'm going to reread or be the first one that I reread this year, which will probably be um, end of January or February. I'm not quite sure when I'll schedule it, but I want to see what people think of these books that I enjoyed so much in my youth. And um, will my uh, mid-20s self or my mid-50s self still like what my mid-20s self enjoyed? So let's get on with some reading. Selection number one. Today, by radio, and also on Giant Hoardings, a rabbi, an admiral, notorious for his links to masonry, a trio of cardinals, a trio, too, of insignificant politicians, bought and paid for by a rich and corrupt Anglo-Canadian banking corporation, inform us all of how our country now risks dying of starvation. A rumor, that's my initial thought as I switch off my radio, a rumor or possibly a hoax. Propaganda, I murmur anxiously, as though just by saying so, I might allay my doubts. Typical politician's propaganda, but public opinions gradually, gradually absorbs it. As a fact, individuals start strutting around with stout clubs. Food, glorious food, is a common cry, occasionally sung to Bart's music. With ordinary, hardworking folk harassing officials, both local and national, and cursing capitalists and captains of industry, cops shrink from going out on night shift. In Macron, a mob storms a municipal building. In Roca d'Amour, ruffians rob a hangar full of foodstuffs, pillaging tons of tuna fish, milk, and cocoa, as also a vast quantity of corn, all of it, alas, totally unfit for human consumption. Without fuss or ado, and naturally without any sort of trial, an indignant crowd hangs 26 solicitors on a hastily built scaffold in front of Nancy's law courts. This Nancy is a town, not a woman, and ransacks a local journal, a disgusting right-wing rag that is siding against it. Up and down this land of ours, looting has brought docks, shops, and farms to a virtual standstill. Arabs, blacks, and as you might say, non goyim fall victim to racist attacks, with pogroms forming in such outlying Parisian suburbs as Drancy, Livre Gorgon, Saint Paul, and Villa Calble, and Klingoncourt, and stray acts of brutality abound. An anonymous tramp has his brains blown out just for a bit of moronic fun and a Circassian is callously spat upon in public too, whilst giving absolution to a CRS man cut in half by a blow 
from my Yatagan, a Hungarian slicing tool, if you must know. You'd kill your own kith and kin for a chunk of salami, your cousin for a crust, your crony for a crouton, and just about anybody at all for a crumb. Selection number two. The great man lay dead while the little men watched and mourned and the rats in the walls perked up sniffling. In all of Longwood House, only the billiard table grew strong enough to hold his dead weight, and on it, beneath his sheet, he seemed to have swelled up in death, or with death, although he'd already been gutted and all his inner passageways inspected. Still, he resembled a mountain of a creature, the bolus of his body so enormously fat for such a short man, fat and round as a china pig, that over the sternum there lay a coating of fat an inch and a half thick, and on the abdomen two inches, and while the omatrum and his kidneys were also burdened with fat, having been loosely sewn up on the pretext of decency, but really to still the shrinking armies inside of him, the vast plains with their horses, troops, carriages, and smoke, the hills with corpses raining down, their sides are pouring through ditches like grain through shoots, and the voices shouting either Viva la Emperor or String up the butcher of our husbands and sons, depending on the year and the place. He seemed at peace. He looked like someone who experienced no inner struggle in relinquishing his claim upon immortality. He was a shell. His eyebrows and the edges of her hair were noticeably stiffened with leftover plaster from Dr. Francis's Burton's unauthorized taking of a death mask, and his flesh and the sheet smelled of eau de cologne. And on the trestle against the table, the wall covered with blood stains of a coarse linen sat his heart, liver, and stomach, each in a basin of alcohol. Behind the basin with his stomach stood a silver pepper box, and behind the one with his heart, a silver canister waiting to be sealed with the silver coin beside it. Doctors and surgeons buzzed about the room. Only they were left now. The others had gone. They and the great man's valet de chambre and first Marmaluke whose tears had dried, who were actually yawning unmercifully, having sat up with his body the previous night to guard it from the rats who, since his death, had made several attempts to get at the flesh. The island of St. Helena, the Longwood House especially, were famous for their rats. A rat once jumped out of the great man's hat as he was attempting to put it on. Selection number three. It can be damned hard to account for some things, and some things, I guess, you're better off not trying. Of course he's gone now. Well, not gone, exactly. Although I have no idea where he is just at the moment, chances are that somewhere, even as we speak, on some shady boulevard in Paris, perhaps, or in the woody brown womb of the Strube in Cologne, some creative soul is experiencing the distinctive, if confounding, pleasure of his company. A tall, pale character, avuncular but young, athletic but frail, sembretic to the point of laziness, yet mentally as agile as any acrobat. Perhaps, like myself, the unwilling object of his attentions will not at first recognize this odd and honored, honored personage. Only the vague intuition, a reluctant wish, will in time ripen into a conversation and ultimately gratitude. Beyond a point, I suppose, no introductions are necessary. The livid face, a black skull cap, 
like an overlarge yamakal, and the expressive dark eyes and ink spot nostrils. You have only to bundle down with a volume of Flaubert, Gretier, or Baudelaire, or Dwaddle through the exhibit of Picasso to make his acquaintance. His gracefully clumsy presence informs us almost 500 years of painting, literature, theater, and poetry. No circus would be complete without him. No opera entirely true to its stage grandeur. Yet for all that, he works his magic in small and intimate ways. As I say, he's too difficult to account for. I hear rumors of him now and then from London and Madrid, Frankfurt and Rome, even Moscow. Here in New York, though, things have been ominously quiet. He's gone, just up and left. And along the once fashionable promenades of Green and Prince Streets in Soho, on the crowded sidewalks of shoppish Madison Avenue, in the shadow of the Whitney, and through the formerly bohemian communities of Tribeca and the East Village, the clamor of artists has all been stopped. But he skipped town, boys, headed for greener pastures, or redder, or bluer, or the comparative adjective of colors yet unnamed. Yet he'll wind up at last at someone's guess. Where he'll wind up at last is anybody's guess. But if I were to make it to Mars, even, but if we make it to Mars, it's even odds he'll get there too. Might even stay a while. After all, someone's got to civilize the place. I mean, what would a space colony be without love, heat, jealousy, avarice, and all the other foibles and the grandiose improbable aspirations that brand us human? Well, we'll see what develops, I'm sure. But just for the record, here is how I first met the guy back when he was much, much older. Selection number four. There were hills behind him, smoke coming off the summits, and fields of a yellowness that made him moan out loud. So must have felt the first man, seeing he was alone upon the world. He could foretell all, billions upon billions of years in a place with seasons, and hills that were sometimes here and sometimes there, and billions more still until time had had enough. He liked to walk for perhaps an hour with long stops between, and then to come upon a high place with a view of the rueful beauty of earth and all that had taken place upon it. Sometimes it was good, a plot turning back a plot turning back to weed, a ruined barn with a vertebrae sticking out. Watching closely, he would begin to piece together in imagination the love affair, notorious in his day, that had perhaps worked itself out where he was standing, and perhaps was working itself out still. He pushed on. Lately, he had taken to using a stick that, with his satchel and his tattered clothes, had a way of making dogs burst into song. His ankles were worn down to a thinness. Moreover, he looked excessively sly. He knew what he knew, and it was this that kept him away from cities. Not that there were any great settlements along this route. On the contrary, he had been traveling all day amid nothing but ruined fields and barns. Now, in truth, he began to have that feeling that the first man surely felt, namely, that it was his part to keep moving, that he was alone, and very probably the world with all its smoke and mountains extended on, on in perpetuity forever. He had felt the same feeling 70 years ago. Now, suddenly, he popped over a hill and there it was. He had seen it before, 
this town. It pleased him. It was no longer, it pleased him that it was no longer than it was, and there were even perhaps some erosion about the western edge where poverty had dwelt. He spied a tumble-down house and, next to it, another, bending slowly to the earth. Knowing what he knew, he could bring up an entire block and look it over in detail. But his desire was to plunge forward and begin at once reinducing, reintroducing himself to everyone whom he had known. And they might organize a celebration. No, they were dead, most of them. Science said so. Or at any rate, are at any rate old now beyond recognition. Okay, those were the selections. Um, if you've made it this far, um, please do comment on um, any of those four selections that you really liked, or if any of them sound really um, horribly tedious to you. Um, again, um, I do plan to reread some of these this year, so thank you so much for watching, and goodbye.